Everybody doing all right this morning? Good morning to everyone. We're going to get our praise service started so we can get blessed in the Lord today with a great word from God. Hope everybody had a great weekend. I hope you had a great week. So we're going to ask you all to just stand to your feet today, and we're going to bless God this morning. Hallelujah. Hope everybody's feeling pretty good. Come on, we want everybody to join in and help us save us. up a little bit and get ready for some great worship and praise this morning. Amen? Amen. And hallelujah. We're going to have our brother Esmond come on and lead us in our congregational hymn, and we're going to move on. Good morning, Fresh Air. We, we gave you a new school, now we're going old school. If you can give me a little bit more volume on this mic. At the cross. There you go. 137 in your hymnals. Here we go. That's it. 
Hallelujah. Not some things, not a little 
peace forevermore. I know that everything is gonna be alright. He's coming back like he said.
given what we owe. Hallelujah. 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 As we prepare a word from our pastor this morning, God bless your hearts. I want to invite your intellect and some of your senses to the book of Psalm. <laughs> Boy, that's my new members class right there. The book of Psalm. Psalm 32. <clears throat> praise God for the men today. Amen. No, praise God for the bros today. Amen. Amen. There that the Holy Ghost has highlighted for us verses of scripture beginning at verse 1 in its entirety. <laughs> I ain't hear nobody say preach it all, Pastor. Yeah. Ain't nobody said that. Dude. Your Bible should read, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, <clears throat> whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long, for day and night <coughs> your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer, Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Selah. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time where you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance, Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many are the sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice you righteous and shout for joy all you upright in heart I want to snatch my subject out of verse 5 I acknowledged my sin to you <laughs> oh, have mercy here today in my iniquity I have not hidden I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I want to use for a subject, this is my confession. This is, somebody say this is <clears throat> my confession. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the superscription that is above this psalm in your Bible does read a psalm of David, a contemplation or that Hebrew word maskil, M-A-S-K-I-L, which is better understood as a writing of instruction. <laughs> These Psalms, along with the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon and Job are the books of poetry but they are also the book of wisdom. And in these books are instructions for life. This is a Psalm of David, a contemplation, a writing of instruction. Psalm 32 is the first of 12 psalms with this particular title. It is full of instruction in that verses 1 and 2, 6 and 7, 10 and 11 are instructions with individual themes. David is thematic in the context of his writing because he puts into divisions certain themes of this one writing. Verses 1 and 2, the instruction is for there to be no deceit in our spirit. And if there is no deceit in our spirit, we make room for the blessedness of life. 
two times it says blessed is yes. blessed is that means that the blessedness of life will not be events or occurrences but rather the blessedness of life will be a lifestyle or a state of being blessings won't come and go in and out of your life but a person who is not deceitful in their spirit will be blessed that Hebrew word deceit means the deception or falsehood of withholding the truth. David is saying that a deceitful spirit forfeits the blessings of God in their life. Verse 6 and 7, the instruction is simply to pray. And if you pray to God, it says that the flood of great waters shall not come near you. Uh, the nature of floods, ladies and gentlemen, is they seep over boundaries and overcome and overwhelm what is otherwise dry land. David says that if you pray, God will keep you from being flooded by things that will seep over into your life and otherwise overcome and overwhelm you. You will be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He says, pray to God while he may be found. That's interesting because my theological issue with that is that God is omnipresent. There is never a place God isn't because he is anywhere that is everywhere. And there's never any one place because he is in all places at the same time. God is ubiquitous. He's always present. And the reason he said, I will never leave you, neither will I forsake you, is because God can't. God is with you always, even until the end of the world. If God did leave one place and go to another, when he left that place, he would bump into himself going into another place. If God, ladies and gentlemen, is omnipresent, David, please make this make sense to me. Because you said, pray to God while he may be found. If God can't be found, God is never lost. How do we find a God who is never lost? The Hebrew word matzah does not refer to him finding you, but you finding him. It is not being absent from you, but you being absent from him. We have to see this statement from an eschatological perspective. David says to pray to God while you can because there will come a time when he will not respond to people who will call on his name, who didn't call on his name before the end of time. David said at that time he will not be found. Verses 10 and 11 instruct us to trust in the Lord. And David says when you trust in the Lord, mercy will surround your life. That's interesting, y'all, because mercy is not what God allows to happen. Mercy is what God doesn't allow to happen. <clears throat> mercy is never about things. It's always about a person. When you pray for mercy, it's God for God to withhold something to happen to you that you otherwise deserve. He says, trust in the Lord and you will be surrounded by things that won't happen to you. Lord have mercy. Everywhere you look and every direction you turn, you will see where God kept some things out of your life and didn't allow things to happen that could have and should have happened because of the mercy of God. David says you'll be surrounded every time and everywhere you will look, you will see what you have been delivered from. You will see weapons formed that didn't prosper. You will see enemies that came at you one way but turned back seven ways. You will see judgment that came from man but leniency and patience that came from God. And David wants us to contemplate thematically on the danger and deceit of the power of prayer, but the marble of mercy. With all of that thematic trust, there are issues, y'all, with the construct of this text. We're not sure if this psalm is a compilation of writings that took place at different times, but were compiled in one psalm, or this took place in one writing containing different conversations. Here's why. In verses 1 and 2, David is writing to us about us through no one in particular. 
there is a he and there is a man who is nondescript. Do you have your Bibles? Verse 1 says, blessed is he. Verse 2 says, blessed is the man. And again in verse 2, it says, whose spirit? He is writing about an anonymous person who is unnamed and unassigned, which means verses 2, y'all, can apply to anyone and everyone, and we can insert our name into the anonymous name's place. Anyone who is blessed is one whose transgression is forgiven. Anyone who is blessed is one whose sin is covered. Anyone who is blessed whom the Lord is whom the Lord has not imputed iniquity on. This is David talking in general to everybody about a nobody that can be an anybody. But then in verse 3, David moves from talking to us about us and now begins to talking about us about himself. He says when he talks to us about himself, the first thing he says is, I kept silent. I groaned. Y'all, it's a startling confession interjected in these conversations which switches a narrative into the first person testimony. He says, hey y'all, I kept silent. He says, what caused me the pain that is written in the remainder of this chapter is, I kept silent. So one, he contemplates his confession. He says, I kept silent. Then in verse 4 and 7, after writing to us about us, then writing to us about himself, y'all, he starts writing him, uh, about himself to God. He stops writing to us and starts writing to God and lets us eavesdrop on this little conversation he has with him and God. Four times he uses in that conversation the personal pronoun I. Seven times he uses the personal pronoun you. The verse five, he says, I acknowledge my sin. I have not hidden. I said, I will confess. Verse five, I acknowledge my sin to you. You forgave my sin. Verse 6, everybody who is godly shall pray to you in a time where you may be found. Verse 7, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs. Four times, y'all, he says, I. Seven times, he says, you. I'll try it again. We're a little slow. It's a little hot in here. Let me try it again. Four times, he says, I. Seven times, he says, you. I, 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 you, 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 four times I, seven times you. Ladies and gentlemen, there's more you than I. The more I write, the more of you is and less of me. Must I decrease that you might increase because in you I live and move and have my being. This is not a big I and a little you. There is a big you and a little I. The same David wrote 24 Psalms ago in Psalm number 8. He says, O Lord, how Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. When I consider thy heavens the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you have ordained what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that you even visit him David is writing in the Hebrew Aramaic pose which means that everything alphabetical and numerical is significant to the construct of this psalm y'all four times I seven times you will you look at your neighbor and say neighbor four times I and seven times you the number four in Hebrew is the number of creation as represented by the four seasons. The number seven is the number of God who made the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day declaring the seventh day as a holy day or the Sabbath day because he completed it in completion and perfection. Okay, seven means divine perfection and completion. David y'all has grammatically, numerically, and subliminally signaled to God in this writing that God I am the right, I am the creation and you are the completion. You created me and you will complete me. I am nothing without you. You are the workmanship. I am just the work. You are the potter and I am the clay. Lord have mercy. I am four times creation. You are seven times completion and perfection. And everything that I am is because of you. Let me pause and bring y'all into the text. Can anybody here testify that everything I am is because of God. Everything I have is because of God. Everything I do is because of God. Somebody wave your hand and testify that I'm here because of God. The alarm clock went up, but God touched me with the finger of love and woke me up this morning. I am who I am 
because God is who he is. Tell your neighbor it's not me. It's the God in me. That everything I am is because of God. David says I got to decrease my eyes and increase your use. I am the creation and you are the completion. And in that conversation, David talks to us about us. He talks to us about himself. Then he talks to us about, he talks to himself to God. But then he starts talking to God about God. Lord have mercy. Now he moves to writing about God, talking to David about David. And an unforeseen, unpredicted switch happens in the text, y'all. When he writes about God talking to David about David, God takes the I and David becomes the you. Verse 8, God says, I will instruct and teach. I will guide. Verse 8, I will instruct you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. It's as if God was saying, David, when you were I... Lord have mercy. Things were kept silent and it almost destroyed you. But when you became I and I became you, turnaround happened in your life because of what I said I would do to you. Whenever I am first, David, you are blessed. I ain't got no church here. Whenever you are first, I have to become you to save you from you. But then the final two verses, David concludes by talking to us about God. Maybe all that was the whole point of the conversation and contemplation to move David through a series of thematic conversations where David finally talks to us about God. Here's why in verse one, we would need our transgressions forgiven. We would need our sins covered. We would need our iniquities subtracted. In verse five, we would need to acknowledge our sin. I'm feeling a little better in here. We would need to confess. Verse seven, we would need a hiding place. Verse eight, we would need instructions and we would need guidance. Maybe the I and you between David and God was really for the benefit of we. Might I suggest to you, don't be so selfish and self-centered to think that everything you go through is for you. Sometimes you are the subject, but not the point. The subject was David, but the target audience is us. Sometimes you are not the point of what you go through. God needs to get to other people, and he will use your testimony to do it. Can I talk to about seven people up in here? What you're going through right now even isn't even about you. Where are my pew captains in the house? Tell your pew, look at them and say, what you're going through now ain't even about you. You've been soaking, you've been pouting, you've been moping, you complaining, but God put you through it to get to somebody else in your life. It's about somebody who's going to go through the exact same thing that they saw you make it through. That's why sometimes God has to choose certain people to put their business on public display. Everybody can't handle it. It ain't the devil that fronted you out. It was God that fronted you out because he wanted everybody to see what you go through. That when he brought you out and you said I am a living testimony people would have to get glory to God because of what they knew you went through which means I'm trying here which means that you are not a story you are a testimony you are not a story you are a testimony I'm gonna feel better off in the ship today you are not a story you are a testimony tell your neighbor I am not a story I am a testimony Here's why a story is a record of events that reflects something. But a testimony is rendered by an eyewitness to provide evidence or to prove something. My life is a living proof. Ladies and gentlemen, do I have any lives that are living proof of the... No, uh -uh, I don't need no story. When you see me walk into a room, you see a miracle walking into a room. When you see me lifting my hands, you see a survivor lifting his hands. Do I have any miracles in the house that can testify I'm a miracle I'm a survivor I should have been dead I should have been gone but Lord you let me live on you don't know my story but you see my testimony shake your neighbor's hand and say I am living proof Tell your neighbor right next to you to the right. Tell them neighbor, God set me next to you because you needed proof that cancer didn't kill me. You needed proof that 
my enemies didn't take me out. You needed proof. That means, ladies and gentlemen, I, that God is not trying to kill you. He's just trying to use you. When people see you praising out of all you've been through, what was a matter of praise to you, what will be a matter of faith to them. That means David had to come through it for others until others could trust God for themselves. Is there anybody around here? Y'all gonna make me feel like it today. Lord have mercy. Who can testify that I've got a reason to give God the glory? I said, is there anybody that, give me 10 people, I'll make number 11. Who can testify, I got a reason. Hey, to give God the glory. He forgave my sin. He blessed my life. He kept the flood waters back. He preserved me from trouble. He surrounded me with mercy. I've got a reason to praise him. Give me somebody in the middle who don't mind hollering back at your boy and say, Pastor, do you think you're the only one up in here? I've got a reason you don't know it. My neighbor don't know it. The usher don't know it. The deacon don't know it. But God know how far he done brought me. your blessing name them one by one and know that you got a reason somebody shout I got a right to praise him I I got membership and membership has its privileges so I will enter his courts with thanksgiving and come into his gates with praise and bless his name do y'all know why because the Lord is good his mercy is everlasting his truth endure to all generations and what God provides through David is living proof of a, y'all catch this, of a flawed life yes, that was turned around by the mercy of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Might I suggest to you that God doesn't need every testimony to be that we've been in church all our lives. Try it again. God doesn't need every testimony to be I served in ministry 50 years. God doesn't need every testimony to read that I was baptized at a young age. God needs some thieves on the cross. God needs some testimonies being now. Uh, uh, I've been in the streets most of my life. I ain't got nobody. He needs some testimonies that couldn't put the bottle down, couldn't stop fornicating, wouldn't come to church, didn't believe in God to become a testimony of what God can do with a flawed life. Do I have any mistake ridden flawed people with your cute boozy self like you ain't never did nothing in life. You are here by the grace of God and I need about 20 grace cases in the house that can testify if it had not been. I need some street people who can testify that he picked me up, turned me around, and set my feet up in church. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I don't care if you got here 65 years ago or you just got here last week. Let the regime of the Lord say so. I need the seasoned saints and the thieves on the cross who just barely made it in the kingdom to say so. Give God the praise. Give God the honor. And is there any seasoned saints that can testify that I didn't always have it together? Uh, see, here we go, here we go with that cute church. I knew it. I didn't always have it right. I didn't always have a straight moral compass. Sometimes I was low down and dirty. But one day I met a man named Jesus. Ooh! And he took somebody who was dead in sin and made me a living proof. Send it up your road right now. Tell your partners in your pew, I'm living proof of the goodness of God. Don't let these old folk fool you. You see them now, but you didn't see them in the 70s. Season says, y'all gonna do me like that? No, somebody wave a hand and say, thank God that God don't put my life on rewind on the screen for everybody to see. I ain't always been where I am. Somebody holler out, but thanks be to God. 
who gives us the victory. Thanks be to God who can clean up a flawed life. Thanks be to God. Here go about five people. I need about five people who can testify and I still ain't got it all together. I knew I had somebody right off in here and pastor, no, I still. Somebody shout, I'm still working on it. But I'm working on it and by the grace of God and by the grace of God, I'm being sanctified. I'm being consecrated. I'm like a tea bag that God just keep on dipping. And the more he dipped me in church, the deeper I get. Do I have anybody that has the audacity to wave a hand and say, Pastor, I'm flawed, but I'm in church? Anybody wave the other hand and say, Pastor, I'm imperfect, but I'm in. Pastor, I don't always listen to gospel music, but. Pastor, I don't always have the Praise the Lord channel on my TV, but I. Pastor, I don't always speak to people in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sometimes my language. Pastor, I ain't always howdy, howdy, good morning. Sometimes you catch me on the wrong day. Somebody say, but I'm here. We in church, ain't we? Boy, I said we in church, ain't we? We like to say you don't know my story and all that I've been through, but because of all you've been through wasn't just for you. We need to know your testimony and all that God can do. First of all, in the construct of this contemplation, David contemplates his confession. Y'all say confession. And here's where David confesses y'all his mistake. Y'all catch this church. This is not the culpability of sin. That's Psalm 51. I ain't got no Sunday school people. Sunday school people. This is the consequence of his mistake. All right. This is not the storm of his sin. This is the lingering and damaging floodwaters after his sin. The force of sin broke the levee. When the storm left, the floods came in. That's why he says in verse six, surely in great floodwaters. The storm was the act of sin. The flood was the mistake, watch this, of concealing the confession. That's interesting. David considers how much he has gone through concealing sin. Mm. That already happened when he could have been happy if he just confessed what he tried so hard and spent so much energy to conceal, watch this, from God. Two times in verses one and two, it says blessed. That Hebrew word for blessed is happy. Y'all say happy. Y'all, he could have been happy. And it is possible for God's people to be happy. Tell your neighbor, you can be happy. If he would have just confessed, but instead he concealed. This is not the first uncomfortable confession of David that he has to make. David, unfortunately, has some character flaws. <laughs> no, don't do that to David. Some of us just as crazy as David. David, unfortunately, is one who's prone to making the same mistakes over and over and having to write the same confessions about the same mistakes he makes over and over. We don't have to go too far back to see it, y'all. Go to Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is an open, direct acknowledgement and confession by David again. Y'all say again. That his life is in trouble when his life is left in his own hands. David is in trouble when he becomes I. He was doing all right until he got to verse 4. When the Lord was his shepherd. And he shall not want. And he was the shepherd's sheep. You know what happened? He enjoyed a plus green pasture. Still waters. A restored soul. Righteous paths. Until he got to verse 4. When he decided even though he had plus green pastures. Still waters. Restored soul. He gets to verse 4. And I shows up. 
and he decides arbitrarily to take his own path and when he does that he walks right into Death Valley. Verse 4 is a confession that he took a controversial and contrary path against God's leading and he's writing this actually while he's in Death Valley and he says yea though I oh Lord y'all ain't getting this he says yea though I I walked in the valley of the shadow of death he was making me lie down in green pastures he was leading me beside still waters he restored my soul he kept me in righteous path but when I took over I walked right into a valley of the shadow of death y'all ain't feeling me he fed me he gave me drink he kept my soul he directed my path but I showed up again and I walked away from all of that from what from green pastures still waters and righteous paths into a valley of death and in Psalm 32 here he is again y'all say again and David is really saying in the whole context Lord is me again not just the same person Lord help us today but the same problem that usually comes along with the same David y'all can we just have a transparent moment up in the ship <laughs> can I ask y'all a question have y'all ever had to say Lord it's me again I didn't learn from the last time. I thought I wouldn't do it again. I said I wouldn't say it again. I promised I wouldn't go back there again. I didn't pay attention to what you said. I got in a certain frame of mind and I took over. And Lord is me again. Thank God this is not David's second time. This is another time. I'm gonna try it again. Thank God that God is not a God of second chances. Lord, hold your boy. I'm going to run when I say this. God is a God of another chance. How many of you can testify God kept giving you, blessing you, forgiving you over and over and over? I'm going to say it to you. Get happy. And over and over and over. It ain't your second time. You didn't been through this again. But thank God that he is a God of another time. Somebody shout, Lord, it's me again. I got to get to this confession, y'all. David begins the confession by telling us, y'all catch this, y'all, that some things happened to me personally this time. Huh? Here's what happened, Dr. Burns. When he tries to conceal it, he says some things happened to me personally. He says, I kept silent. Mm. Y'all be careful not to mistake an errant interpretation of scripture here. I kept silent is not a therapeutic confession. It's a theological confession. He's not saying I suffered because I didn't talk to somebody about it. Or I didn't let it all out on somebody's couch. Or I didn't vent or I kept it up all inside. He's not saying it from a therapeutic standpoint. He's saying it in the theological sense that I should have talked to God about it and confess my sins to God. Here's why. Spilling your business to people may be therapeutic in a sense, but it won't satisfy what only the theological can, which is the confession of sin. John chapter 1 and 9. 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse them from unrighteousness. Proverbs chapter 28 and 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Well, pastor, what about James chapter 4 that says confess your sins to each other? If you look at the context, he's not telling you to go in detail. He just says confess to each other that you are sinners. <laughs> we don't need to know when it happened how it happened who it was with just confess I'm a sinner y'all that's why I confess all my sin to God because I've learned up in church that people will take your business from the altar and put it I 
do all my confessing to God. Do you know why? God is the only one that can do anything about it anyway. And Lord, deliver us from people who always want other people to confess when God has covered the sin in your life. You want everybody to confess when you want to, and you forget that God covered your sin while you're trying to fact check everybody else. Tell your neighbor, I got my own sin. I can't identify in you what I still got up in me. And when I look at you, I say, Lord, have mercy on me. Therapeutic is a band-aid. Theological is the cure. Therapeutic helps you through life changes. Theology really changes your life. I can talk to other people and feel better, or I can talk to God and to release it off of my spirit. And nine chapters later, y'all guess what? David's eye shows up again. He says, I kept silent. Sometimes God lets you be I. Maybe I stands for individual. Because sometimes God lets you do what you want to do, when you want to do it, the way you want to do it, exactly the way you planned it, by yourself. Maybe his I stands for individual, but y'all may, maybe his I stands for independent. Because sometimes God lets you try to do it apart from him just to show you that you're not independent. You are dependent on God. And he will bring you back to the point where you say, I will trust the Lord with all my heart. Lean not to mine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge me. And he shall direct my, maybe his eye doesn't just stand for individual and independent. Maybe all David's eye stands for intellect. Because sometimes God will allow you to feel that you are smarter than God and let you try to figure out by yourself. So he says, I kept silent. God, let me do it individually. God, let me remain apart from him independently and let me go try to figure it out by myself intellectually. And what I found out is I'm not smart. I can't be left by myself and I need God, catch this, to keep me from me. Do I have anybody in here to willing to admit that you're a little crazy? You ain't got to say it, man. Just wiggle your toe. You're a little crazy, and you know that 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 you need God to keep you from your crazy self. Somebody shout, I need God to keep me. Every day, uh-uh, I need God to keep, God, please don't give me a day, don't give me a second where you let me try to be intellectual and individual and independent. No, 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 God, because that's when the devil's going to plant a thought in my mind that will appeal to my crazy nature. And before I know it, God, I would have walked away from you, got away from you, not ask you about it, not pray to you about it, and walk right into something crazy. I can't let I show up. His confession begins with I, because the prerequisite, y'all, to confession is personal accountability and personal responsibility prior to admission. And here's what David has to deal with. This time he has no enemy. 75 Psalms, David writes, and most of the Psalms, he talks about his enemies. This time he has no enemy, no foe, no adversary. David can't even blame it on the devil. He says, I kept silent. And God covered it and revealed it to me personally and internally. Aren't you glad? Let me try it like this. That God will reveal your issue to you and cover you and conceal it from other people. Let me try it like this. God will whoop you on the inside, but cover it up on the outside. You ever had a private whooping but a public covering? And the one being that you cannot lie to is God. The one being you can't fool, deceive, or change the narrative with is God. He knows when you did it, how it happened, who it was with, what you said. Maybe now we know why David kept silent. Because God was the only one he couldn't lie to. Which means, y'all, that silence is a lie, too. Boy, it's hard in here today, Pastor. We got to get this air fixed. We falling asleep. And I'm burning up. Just because you didn't tell somebody what you did doesn't mean that you didn't lie to them. Because the lie is your silence. Having them believing something different, Lord have mercy, than what is actually true. David shows us the damage and devastation of living with a lie. Well, 
They didn't ask him, so I didn't tell them. That's still the lie of concealment. Well, what you don't know won't hurt you. So let me keep silent. Y'all, that's why. Can I, can I teach for a moment? I'm going to get to this preaching. We're going to go home. Lord, Jesus, help us today. I'm trying here, God. You got to help your boy today. That's why I don't ever ask questions that you don't want to know the answer to. Nah, -uh, touch your name and say, don't ask it. Don't, 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 don't. Don't, 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 don't ask it. Don't, don't, don't. Because sometimes your silence is loud. Sometimes your silence is deafening. Let me try it like this. Y'all in my first church, I was counseling this couple who were having marital issues. During the counseling session, Faust, the man asked the woman, hey baby, Since you were with me the first time, have you ever been with anybody else? In my mind, Dr. Gavin, I'm going, don't ask that, don't ask that, quick. don't, don't ask. I said in my mind, I was going to ask that. Quick. And y'all, that woman sat quiet for about a minute. until he finally said, never mind. I already know the answer. David says, I kept silent. Can I take y'all a step further? Come on, y'all get with me today, it's hard up here. Translation, he says, I made myself my own hiding place. And I was hiding in plain sight because everything that was happening to me this time was internal. And I kept it so internally concealed that I didn't think even God could see it. Ladies and gentlemen, what people see is you. What they don't know is how much you carry inside of you. Do I have anybody that can just let it out right now that you got emotions and feelings and weight and burden and heaviness on the inside that don't nobody know? Thank God that he could put a smile on your face. Thank God that he could put joy in your heart because what you carry on the inside, people will never see on the outside. David says, I just didn't say nothing. And what I discovered was concealing and hiding does not stop it from growing and hurting. No matter how deep you bury it. Here's what's interesting about David's confession. Y'all, his silence was not God's ignorance. <sighs> he, how does he think that God doesn't know when in verses 1, 2, and 5, he says God forgives sin. If God is the forgiver of sin, it means that all sin is against God. If all sin is against God, he knows about every sin done in the flesh, with or without your confession. Which means the confession is not for God, it's for David. If he's an all-merciful God who forgives, he's an all-knowing God who sees what you're trying to conceal. All right, y'all ain't feeling me. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you can't hide from God. David confesses, I didn't do nothing but hurt myself. When all I had to do was open my mouth for some relief from God. I can understand about not talking about your sins to other people, especially other people who don't know. But what sense does it make not talking to God about your sin who knows all your sins anyway? I don't know about you, but I know I need God to know all my sin. Talk back with me, somebody. And the reason why I need him to know all my sins is I need him to know how much forgiveness I need. He says, I kept silent. And y'all, here's what happened when he kept silent. Number one, David says, catch this church. He says, I felt it in my health. He says specifically and succinctly in verse three, he says, my bones grew old. Concealing it eternally, he said, it aged me. The longer I kept it in, the older I got. Bones grew old in Hebrew means that his bones began to show like a much older person. 
David is confessing, I began to lose weight. And I got weak because what was an emotional flood became a physical disorder. He says, I felt it in my health. But then in, uh, in that same verse, he says, I felt that it became heavy. The heaviness was not my emotions, my guilt or shame. He says, day and night, God's hand was heavy upon me. Y'all, the bad news, oh Lord, is God's hand was heavy upon him. The good news is God's hand was still on him. Which means that God doesn't move his hand based upon the depth of your sin. Aren't you glad that God still got his hand on you? He just makes it heavy because there's only so much weight of conviction that you can take before you finally confess. And he's trying to hide from God when God's hand is on him. And he says it got heavy. He confesses that God put more pressure on me than I could take. God didn't force me to confess, but his pressure took talked me into it. And watch what he says. I was under pressure. I knew it was God applying the pressure. And what God knew that I didn't know was that I had a breaking point. And my breaking point was when it got heavy. And in verse 11, no longer, he no longer has a shout. He said, I no longer could be glad and rejoice. Verse 1 and 2, I don't know what, it, what I looked like, but I know I wasn't happy anymore. And here's the tension. How do you conceal not being happy? Trying to appear to be one thing. When the reality is, you got another thing that got heavy. He says, I felt it in my health. I felt it became heavy. But number three, he says, I felt it, the heat. He says, I dried up as in the heat of summer. And what burned up was my vitality. That Hebrew word vitality means liveliness. It's when a person becomes motionless before death and needs resuscitation. God does not put a heavy hand on me. He put pressure and heat, weight and drought. I couldn't relieve the pressure. I couldn't save my life. And that's what he confesses. I concealed my health and my heaviness and my heat. But notice something, y'all. There's some good news. But it's seemingly odd because it doesn't fit at first. He says right after the health and the heavy and the heat, over to the side, just a little lower, he writes a word, Selah. Lord have mercy. Hold on, y'all. He's talking about failing health, unbearable weight, unceasing heat. But then he writes the word Selah. Any other time, Selah doesn't go there. Selah is a pause in the text. Salem is a synonym of the Hebrew word that means forever. Selah is a derivative of the Hebrew root salel, which means to raise voices in praise or an instruction to the sons of Korah to make the instruments louder. David says when he thinks about the health, the heaviness, and the heat, he writes praise into the song. Because when I think about Lord have mercy, the goodness of God and all that he has done, he writes a praise in the song. Because if it had not been, Lord have mercy, for the Lord on my side, and he writes three pauses to praise, which means sometimes the Holy Ghost will jog our memory for the sake of a praise pause. And I don't believe that he wrote Selah when he wrote the psalm. I believe that he added that word Selah when he reread the psalm that he wrote. Can you see David jumping up from the table and grabbing a pen in his hand and saying, Lord, you've been good to me. Is that somebody's testimony in here today? That when you look up back over all that you've been through, Lord, you've been good to me. I'm done, but watch what he says when he says, I'll guide you with my eye. God says, I will keep my eyes on you where I'm taking you because you just have to keep your eyes on me. I will keep your eyes on where we're going. As long as you can see me, I can see where you're going. And that's my testimony sometimes, y'all, that I will look unto the hills, Lord have mercy, from which cometh my help, that all my help comes from the Lord. I'm done. Y'all can wake up now. God discloses why he's got David in a classroom. God says, when I surround you, David, he says, I got to teach and instruct. That means my surrounding of you is you keeping you from yourself, but me teaching you about yourself. And here's what he says is the lesson in the classroom. He said, don't be like a horse. And don't be like a donkey who need a brit in 
a Bible. He says, David, whenever you get outside of the perimeter that I set, if you don't surrender to my surrounding, David, you act just like a wild horse. You become a wild thing when you come outside of my presence. So I got to teach you, David, how to stay within my will. Because when you're a wild thing, you got to come back over and over confessing the same thing. And David, I am tired of your little stale testimony of how I took you through and brought you out. Hey, David, quit going through that thing. And you won't have to come back confessing the same thing over and over. And David, there's not a sailor after this one. Uh, but I can believe David just started singing that song that I got to clean up <clears throat> what I messed up. And I started my life over again. Made up in my mind that I ain't lying no more. A liar and a cheater can't make it through the door. And here's what David does. I'm done, y'all, but there's a part two to his testimony. Lord, have mercy. David says uh, there's a part two. Uh -huh. That this is my confession. That, like Usher said, since I got to tell it, I might as well tell it all. That God, I made myself my hiding place. And I confess that I almost died when I leaned on myself. But my confession is, God, now you are my hiding place. You are the place that I need to stay. And David ends the psalm, and I'm done, and talks back to us again and says, be glad and rejoice and shout for joy. He says, be glad. That's my disposition in the Lord. That's my position. Rejoice. That's my repetition shout for joy that's my exhibition be glad that's my start in the Lord that's my status rejoice that's my state shout for joy that's my stage be glad that's my elation in the Lord that's my expectation rejoice that's my exaltation shout for joy that's my exaltation be glad Psalm 34 and 2 my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Psalm 122 and 1. I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord. It's Luke 1 and 19. I bring you good news of glad tidings. Born unto this day to you in the city of David is Christ the Lord. Luke chapter 8 and 1. He went into every city preaching glad tidings of the kingdom of God. But then he says, in the Lord. Psalm 37 and 4. Delight yourself in the Lord. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37 and 7. Rest in the Lord. And wait patiently for him. Proverbs chapter 3 and 5. I ain't got no church here. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Ephesians chapter 6 and 10. Finally, brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Maybe you don't know all them scriptures, but can anybody testify that I will trust in the Lord until I die? But then he says rejoice. Philippians chapter 4 and 4, he says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 6 says rejoice always. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Psalm 126 and 5, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that go forth weeping barren seed shall come in again rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Luke chapter 10 and 20, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. But then he says, shout for joy. Psalm 47 and 1. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout to God for the voice of victory. Psalm 95 and 1. Oh, come, let us sing to joy for the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. I wonder if I've got any shouting people. 
who can testify that in the Bible the angels shout, the saints shout, the saved people shout, and if we don't shout, then the rocks will cry out and shout in your place. Would you high five somebody and tell them that I've got something to shout about? Do I have 10 people to help me to close this little Easter speech and wave your little chocolate hand and say I got something to shout about? Oh, long. I got something to put a sailor that I got to pull and thank God for how far he done brought me. Do I have any pew captains that are in the house that can testify? Tell your pew, look at your pew and say how pew, you don't know how far that the Lord done brought me. Do I have any witnesses? There's sometimes I had to confess that I concealed something from the Lord. But when I came boldly to the throne of grace, I found mercy in the sight of God. Do I have any sinners in the house that can thank God that in spite of what you did, you can go back to the throne of God and say, Lord, it's me again and find the same grace over and over and over and over. I'm going to give you five seconds to go back down memory lane to be like David and reread the psalm and find somewhere in your story where you need to insert a praise. Did he bless you? Praise him. Did he keep you? Praise him. Did he bring you out? Praise him. Did he lift you up? Praise him. Let everything that have breath give God the praise. Let everybody who been saved give God the praise. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Say yes. Say yes. Would you put your arms around somebody and say, neighbor, thank God that he forgave my sin. Neighbor, thank God that he wiped me clean. Neighbor, thank God that I still got joy. Is there anybody on this side who can testify that I still got I'm going to try it on this side. Do I have anybody that been through life's ups and downs that can throw your head back and say, God, I still, I still, I still got joy. Say yes. Say yes. This joy. Help me preach it. This joy that I have. I'm going to try it again for the dead people. This joy that I have. I'm going to try it again for the blood-bought people. This joy that I have. your neighbor's hand. Come on. Shake it like you're going to shake it off. And say, neighbor, I know you've been sick. Say, neighbor, I know you've been broke. Say, neighbor, I know you've been grieving. But this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Can anybody testify? Weeping me. Endure for a night. I said, Weeping may endure for a night. 
Weep in me Endure for a night But joy But joy Sick But joy Broke But joy Frustrated But joy Come on, let's make the devil mad Wave two hands and say, I still got joy. In spite of what I've been through, I still got it. Touch three people and say, I still got it. I still got it. I still got my praise. I still got my hope. I still got my worship. praise it ain't for everybody hold on this praise ain't for everybody but I got a title to this praise this praise ain't for everybody but it may fit your life this last praise is a been through it praise I sure been through it but God brought me out I've been through it but God kept me while I'm I've been through it to be a testimony of what God can do. Somebody shout, show been good to me. Come on, let's go to old school church. Show been good to me. Do I have anybody 70 years or older who can wave a hand and say, show been? good to me. I once was young, but now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Do I have any young people who can testify, show been good to me? Say yes. Yes, 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 oh Lord, yes, yes. sealed it and I didn't confess it and I was put in an internal prison 
the Lord's hand was heavy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People at work didn't know it. People at church didn't know it. Because I can hear David said, I put on some baggy clothes because my bones were showing. I couldn't check what was wrong in somebody else because I had something in me that needed to be covered. The power of the church is us knowing one with another. We are all sinners saved by grace. I'm not going to try to check in you what I can identify in myself. Paul does not say y'all have sin. All of us. Then he says, I'm going to prove it to you. He says, sometimes what I want to do I don't do it and sometimes the things I hate and preach against is the thing I wind up doing Paul said how do I conclude this matter he said when I would do good evil is always present then he asked the question who will deliver me from that man who wants to do what he preaches against he says thanks be to God through Jesus Christ I'm going to open up the altar to somebody who has been concealing something on the inside and you need to confess to God God wants to relieve you today of that heaviness of the concealment of sin God wants to relieve it and forgive you today Forgiveness is right here, right now. Will y'all stand with me if there's somebody who would just come to this altar? Let me pray with you. And let me help you because I don't see anybody because that's what guilt and shame does. There are things I had to confess. There are things that I kept inside. Thank y'all for coming. And David said to me, why are you trying to keep it from God? If you will just, as you're coming, just open up that heart. What you're going to find right here is we're not going to judge. We're not going to criticize. We're not going to fact check. We're not going to Google your name and investigate your life. Because that doesn't matter person to person. What matters is you to God. Are there more who will come? Thank you. Come on. The altar is open. Come on. Somebody just shout release it today. Uh, come on. Somebody shout release it today. You can be forgiven right now. God has known about it the whole time you've been hiding in silence. God, I need you. God, I need you. God, we've kept something inside and concealed it as if you didn't know about it. Maybe we didn't bring it to you, God, because... 
we weren't we were negligent of the fact that you knew anyhow maybe we didn't bring it God because of the guilt and shame that's attached to it but God that psalm we just read said David confessed his transgression you forgave his iniquity David confessed what he sinned against you you forgave what he sinned against other people you went above and beyond what he asked your mercy met his grace and you did more for him because he just confessed he was wrong you don't have to say it with your lips but repeat after me in your spirit say God I was wrong God I knew it was sin when I did it I knew it was wrong God and I thought I was so intelligent so independent that I could hide from you and God that very thing that I did and concealed sowed seeds into my life where deceit has robbed me from my blessings and father I don't want to be that anymore so father I confess my sin to you today I did it I said it I behaved like it I acted like it I planned it I carried it out father today I take personal accountability and responsibility for what I have done against your word and against your will and that has damaged other people I come confessing and I ask God that you forgive my sin that you cl cleanse me God from all unrighteousness wipe the slate clean oh God and I promise you God I promise you I promise you I promise you God that I will go forth in righteousness and live the way you have planned and purpose for my life thank you Lord now you at the altar just outstretch your hands outstretch your hand back in David's day the outstretching of hands was both the giving and the receiving at the same time Lord we give you our sin we give you our confession and we receive forgiveness hallelujah 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 we receive it. forgiveness God we receive pardon we receive and declare that we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ now we receive God that you have taken that same sin and has cast it as far as the east is from the west to remember it for no more and that our names are still written on the Lamb's book of life and God we release the heaviness we release the heat we release our health mental emotional and physical and we thank you for the release today if you've been forgiven just put your hands together and clap to God a hand clap of praise if you've been forgiven just give God the glory and the honor come on if you've been forgiven if you've been forgiven just magnify the Lord and bless his name if you've been forgiven put a smile on your face receive joy back in your heart hallelujah hallelujah praise God hug somebody please and tell them you're forgiven you're forgiven you're forgiven you're forgiven you're forgiven you're forgiven Now here's what I need you to do. Since you have received mercy, y'all listen. Since you have received mercy, I need you to give mercy. Don't be so hard on other people when you have been forgiven. Stop judging other people and be kind and compassionate toward others who need the same grace that you have just received for by grace we are saved and not of ourselves it is the gift of God you may be seated as you're doing that
We're opening up the doors of the church. If you want to join the Friendship Church today, you can come right here or stay right here. Amen. If you want to become a part, yes, sir, brother. I've been looking for you, man. Oh, bless your name. If you want to be baptized in the name of Jesus and receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal Savior, as the forgiver of sin, and to write your name on his book. Come on, y'all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Won't you come? Won't you come? Won't you come? I feel somebody else in the building. God is calling you right now. Jesus is saying, I died for you. I took the place of you on Calvary and was crucified that you may have eternal life in heaven. And all you got to do is come give me your hand and accept me. I'll be your Lord and Savior. And can anybody testify that Jesus will change your whole life? Do I have any? Where are my pew captains? Tell your pew, Jesus will change your whole life. Come on, lift your voices, church. Thank you. You may go with our clerk. And listen, Lord. Listen, Lord. Why don't others not walk calling? Hallelujah. Oh, Master, do. Don't pass me by. the Savior today. Oh, blessed Savior. I need you to hear. What others thou are calling? I need him, I need him, I need him, I need him, I need him. I need him. Let's do it one more time. I believe if we just call on Savior. I want to pray. I want to pray. I want to pray. We know that. That our brother has lost his mother. And I shared with him on the phone. I said, man, I've been there. It's not going to be an easy road. That was 15 years ago. I'm still, I'm still struggling through. That was mama. But I learned something about God and his word that we serve a God who will be the kind of friend that stick closer than a brother. When mom stepped out, Jesus stepped in. I'm not saying I don't cry, I don't cry, I do cry. I'm not saying I don't miss her. The hardest moment of my life was my mama's funeral. The hardest moment of my entire life was my mama's funeral. But y'all know what? God has been keeping me ever since. And here's why I say I still got joy. My Bible says one day I'm going to see her again. What does your Bible say? My Bible say for the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangels and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise. The 
those who remain and are still alive will be caught up. That means there's a great reunion. How many of y'all can testify, I'm going to see my mama again? Uh-uh. This ain't it. God ain't through. But until then, I need him to keep me. If you lost your mother, I want some of y'all to come to the altar. We're going to strengthen and show love to our brother and family today. We're just going to show love. Come on, bring that strength to the altar. Those of you who still cry but still keep moving. Still grieving but still got hope. For we don't weep as those who have no hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Yeah, come on, just love on him, love on him, love on him, love on him. Love on this family. Where mama at? Where's sister Donnell at? Okay, come on, love this family, love on this family. Down, come on over here with it. That's right. Come on, just love on somebody at this altar. I don't have my mama, but I got Jesus. his holy name I miss her but I still got Jesus thank you I still got hope the one who gave birth to me is gone but the one who gave me life is still alive and how many of you know I can call on him when I need him I need some old church people who can testify. Jesus is on the main line. I can get him when I need him. And I can cast my cares upon him. He cares for me. Father, in the name of Jesus, here we are standing as living testimonies. We've had to endure the news. We've had to endure the funeral. We had to endure the memorial service. We had to make the trek out to the graveyard and say bye-bye, mama. But our testimony is that when you took our call, it was your plan. And you gave us a promise that those who are in the Lord will be reunited again. We've had to go through all that, God. But God, somehow, you have given us the grace and you have dried up our teary eyes and you've raised up our bowed down heads. You kept us moving when grief's stronghold on us was pulling us down. You made the load lighter, God. You gave us joy and hope. We thank you for it, God. These many years, Mama has been gone. But your word says you would never leave us. And you won't forsake us. So we stand around our brother and his family as living testimonies. That God will keep you. God will bless you. God will hold you. If you just trust him, God will bring you through. But they need you, God. Wrap your arms around them as they go to the service. Give them that peace that does pass all understanding. Thank you for the life, the love, and legacy of mama. Thank you that love doesn't stop at the graveyard. 
but it continues through life. Thank you for the spirit she left in us, the things she taught us, how she raised us, the way she loved us. And we'll carry that on as precious memories, but we'll do it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now those who've already got the victory, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We've already got the victory. In Jesus' name. No, keep that playing. Keep playing that. Come on, Kenny. song. an old song and say oh how I love Jesus <laughs> because he first can we do it one time I just feel churchy y'all stand to your feet come on oh how I love Jesus come on kid a name I love to hear afternoon church I would like to present and introduce the following persons to you sister Jessica Jackson will you please stand <laughs> pastor sister Jackson would like to become a member on a Christian experience we also have one Asia Davis when Asia has joined pastor but she's going to be soon leaving for Bethune and she's requesting to be baptized Tia Albany, Tia, please stand. As stated earlier, Tia has grown up in this church, but she would like to rededicate her life to Christ. Twala M. Anderson, and Twala Anderson. This is mom and daughter. 
and they are coming back home and like to rededicate their life. And we also have Brother Kendrick Williams. Will you please stand? He desires membership on a Christian baptism. Amen. Brother, we got to baptize you. <laughs> Let me update my Planet Fitness membership. Amen. Praise God. Will all of you please stand? Amen. It is by, not, not you all, just our candidates. Thank you. It is by the grace of God that we do thank you for receiving the invitation to Christ today. Amen. Thank you for becoming a part of the ship. Amen. We know that God has bigger and more things for you. You are not standing there by accident. This moment is not an accident. It is not even because of your choice. It is God divine destined moment for you because God has more for you. God has got a great purpose for your life and it begins with Jesus Christ like David instructing you about him and his relationship to you those of you being baptized will baptize on the first Sunday next Sunday is it next Sunday hey ooh, Lord up down up down I'm gonna be ready I'm gonna be ready amen praise God uh, those of you who are coming under Christian experience, you receive information from our new members class to make sure you have a sure start into the ministry of the ship. Amen. Everybody shout, welcome to the ship. Welcome. Amen. We family up in here. No, I mean that for real, for real. Everybody in here is related. <laughs> if you're related to somebody in the church, wave your hand. You, hey, look, y'all say, hey, look, just look. Yeah, yeah, that's Fort Myers right there. We all related. That this yo, huh? All that is your, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. You may, you may be seated. Praise God. Yes, please announcements, and we'll be ready to go. <laughs> say so this morning somebody shout thank you Jesus amen grab your neighbor by the hand and tell him it's good to be alive give him a good handshake amen some of us so mean we don't even say good morning no more tell him good morning good to be alive <laughs> bless his holy name if you practice operation Andrew would you stand and introduce your guest Amen. If you practice Operation Andrew, would you stand and introduce your guests? Give them a good praise offering. Amen. Praise God. Yes, Brother Dale. Good morning, everybody. Amen. It's a pleasure to be in the house of God today. I feel like I've been away for about two months. <laughs> this is so many services. But I was going to ask you, how long is the anniversary, man? <laughs> Well, I got an excuse. I got my grandkids and my oldest daughter here with us. They're here to live with us permanently. So, so please welcome the new members of the family here at Friendship. Give them a great big welcome. Welcome to the family. Amen. Thank you, brother and sister Powell. Good morning, church. Good morning. My daughter and my two grandsons are here this morning. She is a member, but she came back to visit today. Hopefully, we're going to see her many more times. Okay, amen. Amen. Glad to see you, sis. 
Good morning, Good morning, church. Good morning. If everybody knows my auntie Florence Wayne, who passed away, her granddaughter Tia decided to come to church today. She hasn't been, she's a member, but she hasn't been here since her grandmother passed away. She brought her two kids, two under two, so y'all pray for her. <laughs> Amen. Would there be another? Amen. If you are a first time visitor that's with us this morning and you are not recognized yet, would you please stand? Amen. This is your first time at the ship. Well, all right. Amen. Come on, we can do better than that ship. Amen. Sis, would you just give us your name? Morning, church. Good morning. Um, my daughter, my youngest daughter is a member. And I'm her mom from Massachusetts. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Welcome to the ship. Sorry, y'all. I meant to introduce my mom the last time she was here. She was here for the Mother's Day celebration. So right. my mommy will be leaving today. So please pray for safe travels. Thank you. Amen. So glad to have you with us, Mom. Amen. Good morning, friendship. Um, this is my brother, Rodney Gilmore. He's not a visitor, but I would like to acknowledge him for coming today. This is Kiki and Rock's dad. Amen. But that's my brother. Amen. Good to see you, bro. Amen. We welcome all of you, our visitors. Amen. To the Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. You have silver ships. Gold ship. But ain't no ship like friendship. And we th pray that your stay here today is welcoming and that you experience the power of the Lord uh, in his servants. If you do have a church home, go back and tell your pastor you did worship in God's house today. If not, we invite you to become part of our church family. Amen. Amen. Would you stand out of your seat, go find three people and tell them God loves you and so do I. Right to this. 